We are going live. And um, as soon as I get... Uh, okay. This morning, we're going to be uh, speaking about watching and fighting and building with courage. Uh, we're going to be reading from Nehemiah chapter 4 will be our initial uh, passage of Scripture. Uh, okay, I don't know what I've got that's singing to me up here. But um, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 4. We're going to be in the first 14 verses. Now, as you all are turning to Nehemiah chapter 4, remember Nehemiah was uh, doing his job, and one of his fellows came from Israel in Jerusalem and told him about the, the terrible situation there in Israel or in Jerusalem and how the walls were broken down and the, the people were not uh, doing what they ought to do. And he prayed to uh, the God of heaven and he was the king's cupbearer and he was not allowed to be sad in the presence of the king or he would be killed. Uh, and he was so burdened by the situation that was going on that he came into the presence of the king burdened and sad. And the king said, what's going on with you? And, and he proceeds right there. He's, this is one of them instances. He's standing before the king and he prays a quick prayer. And then he tells the king what's going on. And the, he gets the king's favor. And the king's favor said, well, I'll send you to uh, Jerusalem and you can rebuild the walls and I'll help finance it. And uh, not only that, uh, Nehemiah asked for papers to help him get through the enemy lines so that he could get there. Uh, and then he gets there and he uh, informs the people what he's there for. And they begin to build the walls. And uh, that's what we're doing. We're building walls. We're building up the work of God. And Nehemiah chapter 4 and verses 1 through 14. Uh, New American Standard. Now it came about that when Samballot heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and mocked the Jews. He spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was near him, and he said, Even what they are building, if a fox should jump on it, he would break their stone wall down. Hear, O our God, how we are despised. Return the reproach on their own head and give them up for plunder in the land of captivity. Do not forgive their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out before you, for they have demoralized the builders. So we built the wall, and the whole wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Boy, that's always a good thing when people have a mind to work. Now when Sanballat, Tobiah, the, and the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the repair of the walls of Jerusalem went on, and that the breaches began to be closed, they were very angry. All of them conspired to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to cause a disturbance in it. But we prayed to our God. And because of them, we set up a guard against them day and night, Thus in, Ju in Judah it was said, the strength of the burden bearers is failing, yet there is much rubbish, and we ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. Our enemies said, 
they will not know or see until we come upon them and kill them and put a stop to the work. Hmm. Does that sound like a familiar scenario? When the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times, they will come up against us from every place where you may turn. Then I stationed men in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, the exposed places, and I stationed the people in families with their swords, spears, and bows. When I saw their fear, I rose and spoke to the nobles. The officials and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, I pray today that you would get me out of the way. Father, uh, I cannot do anything to glorify you on my own. I pray that your Holy Spirit speaks words out of my mouth. And I pray, Father, that they would be your words and not my words. I pray, Father, for those who are listening that... um, we're not able to be here this morning. And I pray for those who are uh, in different places in Kentucky and in the United States and in other countries who are listening this morning. We pray, Father, for them. We pray that your blessings be on them. We pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit of God is powerful and strong in this place and, and in the message May it be transferred through uh, the message wherever people are and wherever they're listening. And, Father, let them know that they're loved and let them know that you love them and that, Father, that you care for them, that you're interested in them. And, Father, that the thing, whatever they're going through today, we pray, Father, that you would work in people's lives. Now, Lord, we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Wherever the people of God start doing the work of God, there will be opposition. Plain and simple. It will come from every direction. It will come from people that you would not expect. It will come from your neighbors. It will come from the people that you love. It will come from people that don't love you. There will be opposition to the to the uh, work of God. A worker of weak faith and, uh, and purpose will quit. People who are weak in their faith cannot keep going. Those who are strong will keep going, but a person of resolution and confidence will overcome the opposition and finish the task. Nehemiah was such a person. Notice in these chapters the opposition that he faced from both within and without the city and the victories that he won. The first thing that Nehemiah had to think about and overcome was ridicule. Now, these people have, we've always, God's people have always had enemies. And these enemies in this case were Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, who um, who were there, and they were making fun of Nehemiah. They were ridiculing the people. They were ridiculing the work. They tried every way in the world to cause trouble. These three were wicked men, and they were outside the nation of Israel. They were not Israelites. They were foreigners who were living in the land. Their first weapon was ridicule. They mocked the feeble Jews openly before the leaders of Samaria. Satan is a mocker. You see that in Luke twenty-two sixty-three and Luke twenty-three thirty-five through thirty-seven. Ridicule is a device used by ignorant people who are filled with jealousy. You got to understand, people who are jealous uh, because. They don't have the wherewithal to do what Nehemiah did, to do what we're doing, to come from nothing and start a work for God. Uh, People have a rid; they they're jealous of that. They're jealous because they're they're not the one doing it, and they ridicule us. 
They ridiculed Nehemiah. Nehemiah had to deal with the ridicule. How do you deal with it? I mean, ridicule affects us to some degree. They mocked the people. They said they were feeble Jews. They mocked the plan. Will they finish in a day? And the materials, they mocked the, the stones and the rubbish. They, they mocked the whole situation. Now, how did Nehemiah answer them? How do we answer when we are ridiculed? He prayed to his God. That's Nehemiah's response. That should be our response. He, his con concern was only for the glory of God and a testimony of the nation. So he didn't have personal revenge in his prayers. We must never have personal revenge in our prayers for other people, no matter what. We have to take ourself out of the equation, and we have to ask God to work in the situation and pray for our enemies. Pray for them who do desperately wicked things to us. Pray for the ones who try to abuse us. Pray for the ones who ridicule us. Remember, we are to respond in love. Note that the people still worked as they prayed. For prayer is no substitute for work. You know, a lot of times we see people who want to just pray and pray and pray, but they'll never go outside the walls of the church. We'll pray for this. We'll meet for prayer. We'll get, you know, and it's hard to get people to meet for prayer, but we'll meet for prayer, but we don't want to take our faith outside the walls of the church. We don't want to go out where the rubber meets the road. We don't want to go out and and face people. You know, we have to do that. We have to do the work. We are being equipped to do the work of the ministry. Satan would have loved to see Nehemiah leave the wall and get involved with a, in a dispute with Sam Ballot, but Nehemiah did not fall into Satan's trap. Satan wants to trap us and get us in an argument, and he wants us to forget what we're doing and spend our time spinning our wheels, so to speak, and doing something other than the work of God that he has planned for us. Never allow ridicule to stop our ministry. Take it to the Lord in prayer and keep on working. Pray and work. The second thing that Nehemiah had to face was force in verses 7 through 9. When Satan cannot accomplish by deceit, he attempts to do by force. What a confederation of people we have, Nehemiah 4, 7. And all of them conspired against the Jews. It was amazing how the devil seems to have no manpower shortage. Isn't that true today? Wherever you go, there is no shortage of people who want to ridicule Christians. They want to try to force Christians to stop doing the work of God. So, you know, I saw uh, two people who create designs and invitations. The state of Arizona was going to force them to work for and attend a gay wedding. <clears throat> they wanted to force them to do a special design for this gay wedding. They wanted to force them to be the gay wedding. And that's what the, the Satan's plan is, is to force Christians into situations and get us distracted and keep us from doing the work that God has called us to do. Now those two people are in a battle for their business. You know, they plainly said, you're welcome to come in and buy anything in our store, that, but don't make us design something special because it's against our spiritual background. It's against our beliefs. And the enemy wants to force us into doing his work. 
Satan followed the same tactic in Acts chapter 5 and 6 when he used Ananias and Sapphira and the complaining widows inside the fellowship of the church. People sometimes inside the fellowship of the church will start complaining and try to push the ministry into doing certain things. He also used Judas inside the ranks of the apostles. Satan is a master of deception. He, he has no shortage of labor. He, how discouraged the workers were with all that rubbish inside the city and the danger lurking on the outside of the city. How would you feel if you were building a wall and you would never knew if the enemy was going to peek its head up over the wall with a hand grenade or a bomb strapped onto them? I mean, that's a real possibility in today's world. You might go to the mall and not come home. So Nehemiah was continued to work in the face of the new attack. He prayed, he set a watch, he watched and he prayed, and it's repeated ammunition in the New Testament, Mark 13, 3, Mark 14, 38, the flesh, and Ephesians 6, 18, the devil. Note that Nehemiah did not depend on prayer alone. He set a watch. Again, it's not just we come in and we pray, and that, that prayer is ne necessary, and prayer is something that we have to do, but we have to continue to do the work. We have to set a watch, and we have to be vigilant with that watch. In other words, we can't just pray. we got to put feet to our prayers. You know, there was a lady who uh, was praying against a bar that was in her hometown, and they kept praying and praying and praying, and the bar kept staying open, and it was just doing a booming business. And the church was praying against this bar, and this little old woman got out of her house one night, and she took a can of fuel, and she went down, and she burned the bar down. <laughs> and they asked her, what are you doing? She said, sometimes you got to put feet to your prayers. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting go and burn something down, but I'm suggesting that we have to put feet to our prayers. We can't just pray alone. We got we to gotta keep working and we got to set a watch. Then there was discouragement. Have you ever been discouraged? Are you discouraged this morning? Are you just feeling like it's just there's no use? The, the battle is too strong. It just, you know, it's sometimes, have you ever felt like you were fighting a circle saw? You know, a circle saw just doesn't have an end to it. It just keeps rolling around and around. It just keeps on coming. The battle moves on the, now from the outside of the city to the inside of the city. If you ever felt like the battle was inside your town, inside your house, inside your church, inside your government. Satan followed the same tactic, and he used it a lot of times in the tribe of Judah. Let me show you what the tribe of Judah did. It's not really open that it was the tribe of Judah, but perhaps it was because they were secretly in league with Sanballat. The, the, the tribe of Judah were the ones who began to complain, and it could be that they were already in league with, with Sanballat, and they were just kind of just speaking what they were hearing out in the world. Have you ever had people just go out in the world, and they come back and they try to speak all this negative stuff into your life? Well, they said, we're not able. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of people says about Bethel Church, we're not able. And then there's, they said they were actually agreeing with the enemy. They were discouraged and they were complaining and spread, spread rapidly. What about when the children of Israel sent 10 or 12 spies into the promised land? Ten of them came back and said, man, this is a great place to, I mean, the, the, the fruit and the produce there is 
overwhelming. The honey is flowing. The grapes, we brought back grapes, had to have a pole to carry one cluster of grapes, if you can imagine that. But ten were, came back and discouraged the people. There were two men who came back and proclaimed the truth. And they were there to do the truth. They said, we can go in and take it. We have the victory. God will do what God said he would do. That's one, of the, one thing that we have to determine in our hearts and in our life. We pray, we read the word of God, and we take the promises of God, and we hold on to the promises of God. And we keep praying the promises of God, but then we have to go out and put feet to our prayers. We have to, to take it out where it meets the road, where it meets people. We have to go and visit people. We have to go and minister to people. We have to go and love people. We go in love. We go in love. We go in love. We can't go any other way. Then Nehemiah had to deal with fear in verses 11 through 23. Fear and faith can never abide in the same heart. If you are fearful, you're not going to operate in faith. We can't operate in fear. We have to operate in faith. In Nehemiah 4, 11, we have a rumor that the enemy started that their armies would suddenly invade Jerusalem. The Jews living outside the city heard this report and carried it to Nehemiah ten times. They kept coming back and telling Nehemiah, the enemy's going to attack. The enemy's going to attack. How persistent Satan worker can be. They keep telling us, you can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do it. Remember, fear and faith can't live in the same place. You can't do it. Note that the work stopped and Nehemiah, then 4, 13 through 15, he, ex he knew exactly what the enemy wanted. That's what the enemy wants to do. The enemy wants to stop you. The enemy, he wants to come against you and cause you so much trouble. And he wants to make you fearful. And he wants to make you discouraged. And he wants you to hear, hear the ridicule. He wants the work to stop in your life. He, he wants you to just give up. Well, I just can't do this. It's too much for me. Listen, as long as we are in league with God and God is on our side, nobody can stop us. Remember, Gideon fought an army of unsurmountable numbers with 300 men. God gives us something to do that's too big for us to do so that we know that it's him that did it and not we ourselves. These Jews were wonderful examples of what a Christian worker ought to be. They had a mind to work. They had a heart to pray. They had an eye to watch. And they had an ear to hear. Now, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 35. <clears throat> and that's going to give us what Bethel's Bethel Church's job description is going to be. Isaiah chapter 35, verses 3 through 5. Now, I know this is a kingdom set of verses, but this so accurately describes what we ought to be doing that I'm using these three verses. Isaiah chapter 35, verses 3 through 5. And I'm going to read this in the English Standard Version. Strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance and the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. That is such a perfect job description for the church today. 
In Nehemiah's day, they kept on praying and they kept on watching and they kept on guarding and they kept on building and they kept on keeping on until the work was finished. Today, we need to encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Our women need to take note of this. For all of our women who are hearing this, we have several women out there who have, are hurting and they have no support. They have no contact with church. They have no one to visit them in the home. Our men need to understand there's men that we have that need that we need to go see. There's men out there who have are hurting. There's men out there who need personal contact. We have the work to do, and we have to build a relationship with people. You know, it's hard to just go in and do a cold call, but there's many of us who know people, and we should begin to work amongst the people we know. We know women who are have been here and been a part of this church at times whom we need to go visit and go see and have personal contact with them and we need the women to step up and go visit women there are women out there that need women to come and surround them and love them and bring them into the fellowship. In the same way with men, there are men out there who our men need to go out and touch them with the love of God and show them that there are people who actually care about them in a society that people don't want to even contact. We would rather text than make a telephone call. Companies don't want to talk to anybody. They have 14 menus to get through before you can actually talk to a live person. They don't want to hire somebody to talk to you. We have to have a relationship with people. And the people we already have some kind of a relationship with, we should begin to work with that relationship and show people we're interested in their lives and that we're, we go there and pray for them, that we go there and we give them a, some kind of support from the Word of God. We should always minister the Word of God when it's necessary, and we should always minister the gospel any chance we get. People don't care how much you know. They want to know how much you care. Romans chapter 15, verses 1 two and 2 says, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. That's powerful two verses there. We, in the ESV, it says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. We have weak brothers and sisters, and we have an obligation to bear with that. We, you know, uh, it's easy to say, well, if that's the way you're going to be, I don't want nothing to do with you. And uh, we have an obligation to bear with people's weaknesses, and we need to love on people. We need to go out and let people know that we do love them. You know, not everybody's going to invite us into their home, but we need to go out and show people that we're going to make an effort. We need to love people. Our message to the people is to say to those with an anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, 
and he will save you. In other words, we're not to take vengeance into our own hands. And there are people who have this attitude. And, you know, they get angry about the way things are, and they want to take matters into their own hands. And we need to let people know that God does see your plight. God does see what's going on in your situation. And we need to pray with them, and we need to love on them, and we need to help them through these difficult times. There's a lot of people who have, are going through difficult times, and they're right here all around us. The outcome is in uh, Nehemiah, or excuse me, uh, Isaiah 35, verse 5. The eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. <clears throat> it's our obligation to go out and minister to people who are weak, who are blind, who are in the prison houses, who have failing health people who cannot see for themselves, people who cannot hear. There are some people who refuse to hear. But we need to go to find the ones who will hear. It's, the, it's our obligation, brothers and sisters, to go out and to minister to people out where they live. Jesus told us to go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. We live in a society today that we, we don't want to talk to people anymore. People have lost the ability to communicate. We would rather do it electronically, but let's do it face to face. It's our obligation to bear with weak brothers. It's our obligation to help them out of those, the mud hole that they're in. Whatever situation there, we you know we can't supply the money for everybody's needs. That's not what I'm talking about. But we can go and talk to them and let them know that God loves them and that God is interested in them. And we can hold their their hand, so to speak, in prayer and minister to them. God will answer prayers. And people need to stop having fear, and, and they need to start having faith. And we live in a society today where people are afraid. It's up to our... I'm, I'm saying, I, I'm asking, I'm pleading with our women to go and minister to those who need ministered to. I'm pleading with our men. Let's don't sit in Bible study. Let's, let's go out whenever we have the opportunity. We can go out in teams, and we can go out and minister and talk to people, and that's the way we're going to get it done. We, can, we all know people. We know enough people right now to fill this building and two more if we just talk to them and minister to them and show them that somebody from Bethel Church cares. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we come in Jesus' name. We ask you to work with us. Lord, you know our shortcomings. You know how we are short-sighted. You know, Father, that we get discouraged. We have people to ridicule the things that we say and the things that we do. And, Father, we pray that our words will be your words and not our words. And that goes for every one of us. And, Father, if they ridicule the words of Jesus Christ, that's what they have to do. Lord, we have to understand that when we're rejected, people don't reject us or rejecting Jesus. And Father, help us to go in Jesus' name. Give our women the desire to go and reach out to other women. Give our men the desire. Fill their hearts with the need to reach out to other men. Men are sometimes stubborn. Women are sometimes stubborn. And sometimes they're embarrassed. Lord, there's men and women both who are embarrassed, who don't want to talk about their situation because they're embarrassed. They feel like people will ridicule them. 
Father, give us compassion. Let us fulfill the obligation to bear with those who are weak, just like your word says. Lord God, give us compassion to reach out to the lost. Give us compassion to reach out to other brothers and sisters in Christ who need you. And Father, we thank you for all that you're going to do in our lives and in the lives of others. In Jesus' name, amen. About to get hung up here.